Well, hello, regular Drews. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode 98. My goodness, we are getting up there. This episode, we are very excited to discuss another file. But of course, this is coming out just the week before Thanksgiving, Corey. Mm -hmm. I think this is coming out on the 22nd. So we have a very special Thanksgiving file for you. (laughs) Can you believe that there's a Thanksgiving themed Nancy Drew file? (laughs) Um, Anyway, that is number 77, Danger on Parade. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? I learned that from the Nancy Drew detective. Okay, go. You think you can follow the clues and solve the case of the missing condiment, Nancy Drew? He knows I've read every Nancy Drew mystery ever written. Nancy, please tell me you're joking. Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. My name is Carson Drew, and this is my assistant, Nancy. 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 Nancy Drew. It's curtains for you, Miss Drew. Nancy. Nancy Drew. regular Nancy Drew. This one is specifically like centered and focused around what they call the Mitchell's Thanksgiving Day Parade, yes. <laughs> which is a direct ripoff, just like the clearest ripoff of Macy's Thanksgiving mm-hmm. Day Parade, which I find hilarious. <laughs> I was wondering why they did that, because we mm-hmm. do actually reference in the story, Nancy and Bess go to Saks Fifth Avenue. Yes. And it's like, okay, well, if you can use that store name, why can't we say Macy's as well? Obviously, mm-hmm. Macy's or Mitchell's has a lot more focus on it in the story, right. but... Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think it's similar to... We've talked about this before because we've had this question related to, like, other entities. And I think it's because they talk about the crimes are related to sabotage of this Mm. parade and of Mitchell's in general. And also like real people are representing employees of Mitchell's department store. So if they were to say like, oh, these people are representative of Macy's, then potentially they're quote unquote characterizing Mm. Macy's in a negative way. Um, And so obviously they don't want to get like sued. (laughs) So it might be that, but it is just, it's so funny to me because it's so obvious that it's Macy's. It's almost like you guys, like there's no other Thanksgiving day parade, like in the, you know, so it's like, what, what else is it going to be? Everybody knows. Right. It's just so funny. I do think that this book in general, be I, it's a later, it's a later one mm-hmm. in the file series, and it is, I think, slightly more ridiculous yeah. <laughs> than the earlier ones. Um, and this whole like Mitchell's actually being Macy's is really just the start of <laughs> yeah <laughs> ridiculousness. <laughs> but I don't know. It just makes me love it so much more. Right. I don't know what it is about the files that does that because I feel like when the mystery stories get more ridiculous, I'm I am more quick to lose my patience right. with them and like, oh, this doesn't make any sense and just kind of get irritated. But with the files, when it gets more ridiculous, I just get more and more gleeful. Right. <laughs> I just find it so funny. And yeah, I don't know what that is. Maybe, yeah, maybe because it's just the right brand of ridiculous for me. Mm -hmm. Of course, these were, this one came out in 1992, which was very soon to when we stepped on the scene, Corey. Right. Um, So um, maybe it's just, yeah, more written for me than the mystery stories were in that regard. We talked about that before, though. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I loved it. I love this one. It was really um, fun. I gotta yeah. say, I was a little bit nervous to start this one just yes. because, right? I mean, the last parade centric one we covered, which was, of course, Haunted Showboat with the like mm. Mardi Gras parade and everything, mm-hmm. not my favorite kind of a dud. And so, just because of that, I was like, oh, yeah. another parade one. We're just mm-hmm. gonna have kind of just this bleh atmosphere yeah. but i think mm-hmm. that the setting really hit the nail on the head especially yeah. with being set in new york and everything it mm-hmm. was really really fun especially because we just got back from new york i really enjoyed yeah. it because of that 
Yeah. I was a little bit concerned going into this too, because of course it is themed around the holiday of Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, and historically, right, that's a really contentious holiday of that course. is prone to like a lot of in general racism and, you know, mm-hmm. obviously connected to the genocide of, you know, an entire peoples and cultures and all of that. So I was like, oh God, like what? <laughs> What are we going to say about Thanksgiving in this one? Exactly. But, you know, honestly, yeah, no, there wasn't anything that was, they didn't really talk about it that much. You know, yeah. it was really just about the parade. And so it wasn't that, it wasn't super problematic, I didn't find. So mm-hmm. thank God. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Thanksgiving probably might be like my least favorite holiday. Honestly, yeah. it can be a little bit boring, maybe. Mm-hmm. And so I was afraid that that would carry over into the book, but it really did not. So yeah, it's yeah. fun. It was. It was. I will say I feel like we had more characters in this one. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, that's that's one of my critiques of the book in general is I feel like there was just so many characters so fast. And I was yeah. like, who's that person? Wait, is that that person? No, different person. But like, you remember in, um, gosh, it was the Hardy Boys crossover one in Canada. In- oh, uh, New Year's Evil. Yes, yeah. New Year's Evil. It was very similar to that. I just mm-hmm. feel like I, we get this, we're introduced to like a ton of characters all at once and we're just expected to remember who they right. are like throughout it. And I was like, not, it was not easy to do. Yeah. I kept having like flip back and be like, okay, this is that person, right? I feel like a lot of Nancy Drew mysteries, whether that's the files or the mystery stories, whatever, could use more suspects <laughs> or more characters. And a lot of times it's like, okay, mm. well, there's, one real suspect here who do Mm -hmm. we think it's going to be um and so i was glad that there were more characters but i don't feel like they did the best job of making those people suspects Mm -hmm. like with um just for example jill's friend it's like okay Mm -hmm. i'm glad that we have this like reporter character because it's fun to add that into the mix but yeah what is she doing here she doesn't do anything we don't like we don't we're not suspicious of her at any point i don't know i don't know i have i was pretty suspicious of the reporter friend I thought it was going to get to be where she did something weird or suspicious, but she never did. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I think, I think part of it is strategic in that way Mm -hmm. because like when they, I think, cause we've, we're in number 77 this officially. And so it's like, at this point, their readers are probably the same reader base, you know? And so everybody probably gets the formula Mm -hmm. and so when they drop random characters here and there in there i feel like part of that is probably because they're wanting to sow that suspicion there's like well here's this person seemingly unconnected tends to show up right after things happen Mm -hmm. it's like it's just begging for like them to actually be the culprit and so i was waiting for it and so there is some of that element to having all of these characters in there i was like no no no, it's a little bit too convenient right (laughs) um but then i think i think it's probably just maybe like one person too many or maybe like two people too many because like we we meet people and it's like we're introduced to them first name last name Mm -hmm. and like and job title and job title Mm -hmm. and they may show up like once more again but then that's it mm-hmm. i'm like eh, eh. like i don't need to know the name of jill's assistant and like <laughs> you know, like like that's really not relevant i no. don't need to know that but if it's so yeah so i think mm-hmm. it's i think it's it is somewhat purposeful but i think it's maybe a little bit too overboard mm-hmm. but yeah. we could have done maybe a little bit better job of it i don't know i mm-hmm. feel like the the main suspect who I had in mind, we didn't focus on that person mm. enough. And then mm-hmm. the people that Nancy did suspect, it was like, that's a little thin of a reasoning. I don't know. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. But yeah. Overall, very yeah. fun. Loved the setting. It made me want to go back to New York like right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially because mm-hmm. a lot of the things that they did and the things that they saw, we also went to yes! those places and saw those things. So it was really yes. cool to actually have that, the visual in my memory because yeah. of that. Yeah, it was very cool. I did feel like the vibes were totally on point. It yes. felt like they were in New York. They were catching cabs. They were running around all over the place. They were shopping, like taking the was, subway. Yep. Yes, it was perfect in yeah. in that regard. I just think in general, like I was saying before, it's just so ridiculous. Like the fact that they're going there for the parade is fine but Mm -hmm. it's not just that they're going there for the parade it's that they're going there to like get a like behind the scenes look 
at the parade and because Aunt Eloise has some kind of random like acquaintance or something. (laughs) So she hooks them up. And then like once they have like gotten this like backstage tour, they meet all of these people who are like employees of Mitchell's Mm -hmm. and suddenly they're just best friends with all of them and getting invited to like so many like parties with all of these stars because they're going to be involved in the parade. They meet them once and they get invited to lunch with them and interviews and it's just dance dates in that evening, like after parties for the cast. And And I'm like, who? wait, I'm sorry. (laughs) They just meet these random girls and like suddenly they're like, yeah, come along to every single event and like schmooze with all these people. Like, oh my God, talk about a charmed life. And that's really only (laughs) scratching the surface. There are a couple other uh, really ridiculous, crazy things that happen to these girls that I just want to save because I find them so funny. I'm not going to mention them yet, but it's coming, you guys. Oh my gosh. That's that best Marvin charm. That's just, she just turns it on. It's that easy. (laughs) I guess so. But yeah, no, I loved it. I loved it. Mm-hmm. It's so, a great one for Thanksgiving. Yeah. I really thought it could have been way worse than this, and mm-hmm. it outshined. Yeah. For sure. Okay, we got to talk about this cover, though, because yes. what is this, Corey? <laughs> I'm well, sorry. first of all, this is Trisha Zimmick did the cover for this, who, of course, we Look met at the, at the convention last year. I know. Look at the I cat. Know. This is the craziest cover I have ever seen in my life. It's incredibly joyful, and I love it a lot. It's just a lot to look at. I'm right. like, what is going on here? Um, but so we have Nancy in the foreground. And I do. Okay, so I do notice something about Nancy in this and I don't know if this is just at this point in the files or maybe it is Trisha's influence or something because I remember her talking a little bit about this Hmm. and her talk at the convention this Nancy on this cover is much more understated and kind of I don't want to like she's just as put together she's you know Mm -hmm. clean cut but maybe like a little bit more reserved yeah like her hair is simple her outfit colors are simple and kind of classic as per usual but just like a little bit more like neutral like more neutrals um she doesn't like quite stand out as Mm -hmm. much on the cover as i feel like as she does on others and trisha was talking about how she was kind of brought on board to kind of update nancy's look a little bit um to make her seem a little bit more polished and so i wonder if this is this is part of that direction i find it fascinating i also find this like a much more like classic kind of 90s look i love it honestly yeah i think I love nancy it. looks so good she does she does and it's just something that's like nancy is such a sensible person that like this kind of outfit is definitely i definitely see it as something nancy would choose she's just wearing jeans this like tan coat and like a kind of dark purpley scarf mm-hmm. um kind of wound around under, around her neck underneath the coat but i just think something about the hairstyle just being like simple down like mm-hmm. there's nothing going on there it's not curled crazy or anything like that it's just like yeah that's what nancy would wear like she's yeah. not of course it's really nice quality clothes she's a rich girl you yeah. know <laughs> like she's gonna be wearing the best things but they're classic statement pieces she's mm-hmm. not She's not wearing like trendy stuff. She's just wearing, you know, normal clothes, which I just love that about her. Not rocking the mullet anymore. Exactly. (laughs) No more 80s mullet. Thank God. But so this scene on this cover, I feel like is not particularly representative of a scene in the book. Um, Like it could be when the rope is cut at the Natural History Museum, but that occurs Mm -hmm. inside. But then there are also like slashed balloons on the ground, which occurs in another scene in the book. But again, that's inside. And so it kind of seems like a weird amalgamation of scenes. And so it ends up looking like something that never really happened (laughs) in in the book. But I mean, the the balloon, the cat balloon is clearly so striking. the true star of this cover. Yes. <laughs> like, like, first of all, terrifying. There's something really mm. scary about the eyes on that yes. cat looming over them. Um, but yeah, it's red and yellow and bright. And you can't, when you look at this cover, you can't see anything else. <laughs> And props to Trisha for creating such a distinctive, like, cat character. Yeah. Um, Because I want to say in the book, they 
they like point out, they're like, that's that really famous cartoon cat. And mm-hmm. they, of course, don't say what it is. But in yeah. my mind, that is either the Cheshire Cat or Garfield. It's uh, one yeah. of the two. It's Especially for the Thanksgiving. De- yeah, I was thinking gotta Garfield. Be Garfield. And so, of course, they can't have Trisha paint Garfield on the right. cover of this book. There's no way. But then you're just yeah. left with like a vague cat. No, she mm-hmm. actually made like a really distinguishable yeah. looking cat here. Totally. Cool. Totally. Is it where it's wearing like a is that a beret? I thought I thought it is, yeah. Yeah, it that's looks like it. So interesting. Yeah, but it kind of looks like the smile on it is a bit Cheshire catty, mm-hmm. but but the outfit is totally unique. And so yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. I'm like, what what is going on with that? What is that? <laughs> so I'm definitely interested. You yes. know? And of course, as we learned from Trisha at the convention. The books were often not written until after she was done right, with the art. Of so, of course, that yeah. would explain why she kind of had to make this amalgamation of mm-hmm. everything that kind of happens in the book rather than yeah, the one specific scene. Yeah, they probably gave her a prompt that, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, was not actually, didn't end up being a scene. So, but I do love like kind of like the New York skyline buildings in the background with all of the trees. It seems mm-hmm. like they might be in like Central Park in this. So I feel like the vibes of the cover are on point for what the vibes of the story are. Like it feels very New York, very mm-hmm. parade, very 90s, which is like, yeah, yeah this is it, it, you know? So excellent, honestly. Is this Greg? Uh, I don't know. I, that's that's a question that I had. I feel like maybe it was supposed to be Jules. Um, maybe. Because he was blonde, right? I don't know. I feel like know. Jules was supposed to be blonde, yeah. I mean, I feel like Greg is the big character, the big kind of male character in the story, so it would make right. sense to me that it would be Greg, but in the scene that I feel like this might be portraying, or scenes that it might have been portraying, he wasn't present for either of those. Jules was present for one of them, um, and so I'm wondering, I don't know. I don't hmm. know. But he yeah. certainly has like the 90s kind of heartthrob hairdo, which yes. <laughs> does kind of lean me towards thinking it might be representative of Greg. Also a gorgeous like leather jacket, like oh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Very nice um, look. Very nice look. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Oh, well. Oh, well. But anyway, should we do, should we jump into three words? Yes. I feel like there are so many options here. I mean, New York, obviously, New York. is the uh, unspoken yeah. character in the background. That's so true. You're yeah. right. We should say New York. One of them, I feel like, should be perfume. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, Because that was a random subplot I was not expecting. Um, So New York perfume. And then, I don't know, Aunt Eloise, I feel like, has excellent scenes in this, which I'm so excited to talk about. I'm so glad she was in this one. I was oh worried that we would just get like a little brief thing at I the know. beginning and nothing more, but know. we get some good Eloise moments. I was so satisfied with the Eloise moments that we got um, and I'm so excited to talk about those. So yeah, okay. New York and Eloise perfume. Perfect. Perfect. That's perfect, it. Perfect. Okay. Do you want to start us off, Corey? Sure. Okay, so we start off. Um, it's just Nancy and Beth this time. George is not with us for some reason, but they are both in New York City to celebrate Thanksgiving with Aunt Eloise. Um, Aunt Eloise is kind of friends with somebody who is running or planning all the logistics for the parade. And so Aunt Eloise has arranged for this woman who will learn her name is Jill. Uh, she's going to take us on a tour of where they like build the floats and everything and just kind of give them the behind the scenes tour of everything. Um, And I think they arrive on like Monday or something. We're obviously going to be in town until Thursday, but it's a few days before the parade at this point. And Nancy and Bess go to this Mitchell's department store. Of course, not Macy's. Um, (laughs) They go to meet up with Aunt Eloise's friend, Jill Johnston. She gives them a small tour of the executive office at the Mitchell's department store building where the girls see the list of the performers for the parade. Um, And then, of course, the big like main. I don't know if he's like the MC of the parade or he's like the big guest star, but he's supposed to be this. The Grand Marshal. And I was like, Grand Marshal. Thank you. What does that mean? (laughs) Yeah. Grand, what does a grand marshal do? Uh, I just thought it was a wild title. I feel like today in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they would that would just be the person hosting, you know. Right. But 
I don't know. He's like on a float. So I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but he is this uh, like super heartthrob movie star that all the teen girls love currently, especially Bess. Um, his name is Greg Willows. Um, and so they see his name on the list as well. And Bess is super excited, obviously. Yeah. But then Jill takes them, I guess, kind of across town. Mitchell's owns this warehouse where the floats are actually being built. Um, and it's very exciting. So they get to kind of walk around there and get to see all the floats and everything. Um, and then there's also this area of the warehouse where there are men using oc- mm. ox. I think it's oxyacetylene. Oxy- oxyacetylene torches. I don't even know what that is. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whatever. They're really dangerous and can be prone to explosion, I guess. So I I guess Bess accidentally walks too close into the area. So Jill is like telling her to get away from there. And in doing so, like startles Bess and Bess like accidentally drops her purse and things kind of go like spilling out and everything. (laughs) Um, So she scrambles to grab all of her stuff up. And then they go over to meet somebody named Jules Langley. We learn that Jules Langley is the son of Howard Langley, who is the owner of the Mitchell's department store. I don't know why. I kind of picture him as like a Mitchum Huntsberger type Mm. from Gilmore Girls. Yeah, Yeah. I can see that for sure. But we learn that Jules is responsible for the Mitchell's cosmetic line and actually offers to give Nancy and Bess a tour of their cosmetics factory, uh, which is like next door to the parade warehouse or something like that. Um, so they go to do that and they end up getting some free lipstick and perfume samples, which is <laughs> really fun or whatever. So they go and get that tour and everything. And then they end up going back to Jill's office to meet back up with her. And there they meet a man named Neil Steam, who is in charge of PR for this event. Um, and also Greg Willis is there. So Yay. Bess is like super starstruck. She and Nancy are both kind of freaking out. And Bess starts flirting with him pretty much immediately, <laughs> obviously. But as she's doing that, an explosion goes off in the warehouse. And, like, all the windows in the office shatter and everybody has to, like, get down so they don't get covered in glass and everything. They all manage to get out of the building just in time and they only have a few, like, little scratches on them. They're okay. But the building is now on fire. Right. Um, So, of course, the smoke alarm starts sounding. Everyone evacuates. They all get outside. Emergency crews start arriving. Fire department starts working to extinguish the fire and treat the wounded. And it seems like everybody is okay. Everybody only has a few scratches on them until they see Jules unconscious being brought out on a stretcher. Um, Apparently something maybe hit him in the head or some debris or something. So he seems to have a head injury and is obviously not talking about what happened to him. Um, Nancy goes over to the fire marshal and he tells her that it looks like the explosion was caused by the oxyacetylene torches, but they don't know exactly what happened or how this accident got started. Really not sure yet. Um, so Nancy, of course, offers her investigative services to Jill and Neil, but Jill's like, no, you're here on vacation. Your aunt would never be happy with me for that. Just no, just go enjoy your vacation. Forget about it. Uh, But then at this point, Greg Willows, who is kind of standing around them right now, offers to take them to lunch because he is about to go meet up with a friend of his. Um, And then afterwards, they have like an interview or something that he has to go to. So um, Bess is, of course, thrilled by this invitation. (laughs) So they accept and they go to lunch with him. The friend that they were going to meet is another movie star friend of Greg's. His name is Rob Dunn. Um, I think this is really the only time we meet Rob Dunn, so his name is not important. Um, But they have a nice time, and Greg is very, very interested in Bess. Clearly, they're flirting the entire time. No surprise there. Right. Uh, But then he actually ends up inviting them to come with him to his interview that he has later that evening. He tells them where to meet up or whatever. So they're going to go shopping first, but then afterwards they'll meet up with him to, I guess, just watch him do this interview. Yeah. (laughs) Like, Um, why? Why? It's honestly so wild. It's like you met this girl five minutes ago, a building exploded. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, why don't you come to lunch with me? Like, what? We're all like shaken by that experience. So you need to come hang out and with then, me the rest of the day. Okay, I get you have a nice time at lunch, but then you invite her to your magazine interview. Like, what? 
Like, why? Like, one, why do you think she wants to see that and be there for that? Is this just mm-hmm. like a pretentious movie story thing? Like, oh, I'm so mm-hmm. famous. Come to my interview later. Like, so you can see this how be cool famous I am kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Or yeah. like, like, what is this? Like, <laughs> I just is it a date? It like, what is happening? Yes, but also, like, I don't, I cannot imagine as like a celebrity. Like, this guy is a major celebrity. Like, I can only mm-hmm. think he is like Brad Pitt level status, like right. at this time. And so, to think like you meet some girl who's like clearly interested in you, and like, yeah, you're flirting back because I'm sure it's fun to like be desired or whatever. But like, really, you don't know this person and also like this incredibly like scary horrible thing just Mm -hmm. happened you're gonna be like yeah let's go on a date let me get to know her more you're not gonna be like "Mm, (laughs) maybe i'm gonna go back to my hotel like maybe i'm gonna like not talk to rando people i don't know i just i just think it's wild it's wild but i guess yeah no one can resist the charms of best marvin is what we're supposed to be getting from this so i mean that's believable of course but i feel like if you're one of the world's like biggest movie stars and something ha- like this happens that's the rest of your day like things are canceled you're yeah. gonna go somewhere else that you know is safer than mm-hmm. where you're at because you don't know what's gonna happen next right yeah i don't know yep but whatever so they accept the invitation to go see the interview later but they have some time to kill so they decide to go shopping um we're gonna go to Saks Fifth avenue like i said and then on the way I guess back, they stop at the Rockefeller Center mm-hmm. to watch people ice skating. Um, of course, we've been to that exact same spot, yes. <laughs> so they're just kind of chilling in this area. And then Bess goes, it, I guess the sun comes out or something, and Bess goes to grab her sunglasses, and they're not there. Mm. Completely missing from her bag. And she's like, I can't remember where I last had them. And Nancy's like, well, you must have lost them at the warehouse tour. Why don't we just call Jill and see if they have them there? Um, so they find a payphone and Bess calls Jill and she hangs up and Bess is crying. Mm-hmm. And Nancy's like, what happened? What was that phone call about? Why are you crying? And Bess tells her that Jill told her that the investigators think that the explosion was deliberate and they need to talk to Bess right away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, of course, Bess is freaking out and they head back to the warehouse to talk to the police And when they get there, the police pull out a plastic bag that has inside of it Bess's sunglasses and the matchbook that she had had in her her purse that morning. And they're like, recognize these? And she's like, well, yeah, they're mine. They must have like fallen out of my bag this morning when we were touring the warehouse and I dropped my bag. And I dropped everything everywhere. Right. Everything just (laughs) spilled out. I must have just like missed grabbing those things. And the police tell her that, well, this is the only evidence we have for anybody. So, I mean, we can't clear you. You are our top suspect. So we need you to not leave town for a few days until this is all settled. So Bess is just distraught at this point. I would be as well, Bess. This is terrifying. And she tells Jill, like, I did not do this. You have to believe me. There's no way I was involved in this. And Jill's like, yeah, Totally, whatever you say, Bess. And just like it's very clear that Jill doesn't believe her 100%. Right. So this is just crazy to me. I'm sorry. Jill, you saw Bess drop her stuff. Like you mm-hmm. saw this happen. You're the one who like scared her so that she dropped all of her stuff. Yeah. And like now you're like, mm, I don't know that I believe you. You like this is a girl who just came in from out of town to like come see the behind the scenes stuff. Like clearly she doesn't have any motive to be right. like blowing up your warehouse, but like the police are like, well, we don't have, you know, evidence that it was anybody else, so it must have been you. And Jill's just like, mm, they must be right. Like, what? What? Those sunglasses don't prove anything except that Bess was physically in the building earlier, which we already knew. And and also hundreds of other people were as well. Right. So. Right. Because <laughs> the sunglasses were not found in, but near the restricted area. And so that points to guilt. Did you find no other belongings in the entire building? Seriously. That belongs to anybody else? Like, okay, yeah. sure, whatever. But at this point, it is time to go meet up with Greg for his interview that they're going to watch. And so they do. And what do you know? They get selected as models (laughs) during this process. 
<laughs> so they're basically just like in this interview room and he's got an interviewer and a photographer sitting there and they're just in chairs in the corner of the room or whatever, <laughs> watching everything. And somebody from the magazine that he's interviewing for rushes in is like, I have a crisis. My <laughs> models can't get here in time for the photo shoot. Oh my God. And Nancy and Bess are like, oh, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, I'm doing this before and after photo shoot. Actually, are you girls busy right now? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. This is so ridiculous. How does this happen? They go to they go to New York. They get this crazy behind the scenes tour. Like Aunt Eloise doesn't even really seem to be friends with this Jill Johnston lady. Like right. we'll talk about that later, I guess. But like, so they get this crazy backstage tour. They meet a superstar, like a legitimate celebrity. He mm-hmm. invites them not to lunch to the magazine interview, and then at the magazine interview, they're like. They get chosen to be models for a makeover story? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Is nobody else in all of New York available for this? Like, surely there are actual trained models in New York that you could get. Oh, my God. At a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. Surely. Surely. Like, oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. Also, this is not even, like, the full crazy part of it. We got to get, we got to keep going because there's more. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh, this is too good. Yes. So so they get whisked over to the, I guess, salon. Right. And I guess it's like a world famous salon because <laughs> the, the magazine woman mentions it to Bess and Bess is like, oh, I've always oh. wanted my hair cut there or whatever. <laughs> uh, so they go over to the salon, they get makeovers, they get their hair cut, they get their makeup done. And then they get the photographer to come over and like actually start doing the shoot with them. And then at this point, Greg and his friend Rob, who we were with earlier for lunch, they show up because now they're done with their interview. Right. And then (laughs) the photographer is like, I have a great idea. What if we pretended y'all were couples? And so they get Greg and Rob to pose with Nancy and Bess like it's their boyfriends or something. (laughs) Ah! Doing these awkward couple photo shoots. Except, um, like, so, it's, yeah. it's not awkward at all. It's like, ooh, so flirty yeah. and so fun. And we're going to yeah. get to be on the cover of a magazine with these celebrities. And we're going to look so cool. And I'm sure Ned's not going to be jealous at all. <laughs> I right. Just, right. It's just crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, they get pampered for the afternoon. <sighs> and this cheers best right up. She's right. able to kind of take her mind off of the... Uh, suspicions against her i guess um and then greg still has not seen enough of them yet so of course he invites them to a dinner party (laughs) at some cafe nearby um and then rob declines to also join them i guess he needs to go to an audition or something like that and so whatever but then at this point nancy decides she's going to go meet back up with jill so she tells bess and greg to go on ahead and she'll just meet up with them later Uh, So Nancy goes back to Jill's office, and when she gets there, Jill gets a phone call. And then she turns to Nancy and says, someone just broke into the cosmetics lab. Oh, my gosh. It's just keep on coming. So Jill and Nancy, like, rush over to the cosmetics lab, which is, of course, right next to the warehouse. Um, They talk to the security guard and the police who are already there. They end up going into the lab to take a look, and it seems fine like there's no real damage done and they're not really sure that anything is missing because they're like doing a search right but nancy then spots a handkerchief or a piece of a handkerchief actually like underneath a table or something with the initials lc on it and she shows this to jill and jill immediately sees these initials and thinks of some guy whose name is wait (laughs) i'm sorry get this (laughs) lewis clark Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Like Lewis and Clark, but just Lewis Clark. Um, And apparently he's the owner of a competing department store named Clark's. And apparently he's been, he's tried to undermine Mitchell's before. And so Jill kind of suspects that maybe he is the one who has broken into this cosmetics lab. Right. Anyway, the press arrived, including an old friend of Jill's whose name is Eileen Nash. Um, And so Jill gives a statement to them about the break in and the explosion And then afterwards, um, like after this interview, Jill is talking with Eileen and Nancy and Jill makes a comment about how frustrating all of this like 
these incidents have been and how she wishes that Neil still had this job so that he would have to deal with it. She wouldn't have to deal with this Um, because apparently Neil, who is now in charge of PR for the parade, he used to have Jill's job. Like he used to be responsible for the parade. Um, But now he only manages the entertainers for the parade. So Jill's feeling a little bit (laughs) annoyed about that. I'm sorry. We need to talk about the (laughs) logistics of this parade. Yeah. In what universe would we have just like a random full-time Macy staff member just kind yeah. of volunteer to also take on parade organization right. mm-hmm. in their spare time? Yeah. Like, no, this there is somebody who that's their full-time job is yes. putting on this parade. I'm yeah. sure of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the actual structure looks like, but I'm sure they have a dedicated team for this and not just like a who wants to have their yeah. turn this year. Mm-hmm. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to know what the actual structure is on the inside, but it definitely seems like this is not Jill's only job. She has yeah. a lot on her plate. So, yeah, <laughs> interesting. Jeez. Um, but Nancy asks if maybe like Neil is resentful that Jill has the job now and he doesn't. But Jill's like, no, no way. He's always been super helpful with the parade. Like if he was resentful, why would he be so good natured and everything about it? Which, okay. Afterwards, um, both Jill and Nancy go to the dinner party that Greg invited them to. They have a nice time schmoozing with all the other stars there. And then the next morning, Nancy decides that she is going to stop by Clark's department store to try to interview Lewis Clark to see if she can figure out if he was behind the cosmetics lab break-in. So she goes to this department store and she pretends to be a New York Times reporter. And... And then the receptionist just looks like, yeah, go on in. I don't need to see a press badge. You're good. Just no walk credentials, right on back. nothing. She's just like, yeah, I'm a reporter with the New York Times. Okay, great. Go on in. What? What? Okay. So anyway, she meets Lewis Clark and she starts asking him some kind of benign questions. But then eventually she asks about how he deals with his competitor, Mitchells. And Lewis gets irate and ends up kicking Nancy out, saying, if I ever see you around my store again, I'll ruin you and the Mitchells Thanksgiving Day Parade. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Just a very pointed threat. Um, But thank you for that, Lewis. So... Later that afternoon, Nancy and Bess are invited out to lunch with Greg and Neil. Um, But when they arrive, though, Greg is, like, really cold towards Bess, which is obviously Mm. really different from how he was acting the previous day. And he ends up explaining that Neil told him that Bess is the prime suspect in, like, the sabotage, the explosion. And Bess is so devastated by this that she kind of, like, breaks down and starts crying. And so she and Nancy go to the bathroom so that (laughs) they can, like calm her down right um and then by the time they get back to the table greg is gone he's left without saying goodbye and that devastates Bess even more so great great they talk to neil a bit though because he's still there um but then he has to go too but he accidentally ends up leaving his mitchell's id card on the table um so nancy like takes it and plans to like give it back to him later tonight um at this party that he's invited them to Oh, so many parties and dinners, and my God, they're so important. Um, (laughs) Oh, my gosh. After this lunch, the girls go back to the Mitchell's department store and meet up with Jill. um, And she tells them that she's feeling better about everything today. um, And now she needs to go to a nearby costume shop because they haven't delivered some clown costumes that they were supposed to. So they all walk over there together. Um, Once they get there, the clerk at this costume store tells them that actually their order of the clown costumes was delivered and signed for just yesterday. And Joel's like, no, they weren't. That's so weird. Can I see the sales receipt for that? And he pulls it out and shows it to Jill. And on the receipt is signed the name Bess Marvin. Bess? (laughs) No. (laughs) Of course, Bess did not sign for these clown costumes. And she denies that and everything. But they end up, like, comparing her signature. She's like, I'll sign my name right now. I'll compare it. Like, that can't be my signature. So they do that. And when they compare the signatures, they match. Mm. And so this is not looking good for our friend Bess. (laughs) And Jill gets so angry again. And she storms off. And... And so Nancy is just thinking, like, what is going on? Like, did someone somehow trick Bess into signing this without realizing so that they can frame her for this? But, like, 
why are they framing her? And she ends up tracking down the costume delivery person. He can't remember who he saw when they signed for the costumes. And Beth says the only thing she remembers signing, like for this whole trip since she's been in town, is a sales receipt for a scarf that she bought at Mitchell's when she was with Neil and Greg the other day, um, which is just like she just happened to to do. But so Nancy is like, well, maybe someone somehow got your signature from that. So they end up going to talk to the sales clerk at Mitchell's. And the clerk goes to find the receipt for the scarf that Bess bought. Um, and Bess's signature is on that. So that's kind of a dead end, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, Bess then suggests that they try to go and talk to Jules, who is now, to the, now out of the hospital and recovering at home because maybe he saw something at the explosion, can clear her name from the explosion at least. So they go to visit him, and he is okay now aside from a cast on, on his arm, but he tells them that he didn't see anything before the explosion. But then he does say that he actually suspects his father of trying to sabotage the parade. Um, mm. Of course, his father is the owner of Mitchell's, so it's like, why <laughs> would he <laughs> sabotage his own parade jewels? But he says that he actually hates the parade and he thinks it's too expensive. And he even he only even agreed to have the parade this year because of Jules's success with the cosmetic line. But Jules had spent like a lot of the profits from the cosmetics line. So he thinks that like his father is like salty about that and is maybe doing this sabotage as like a way to like get back at Jules for doing that. I don't know. And and also to like make the parade so unsuccessful that like there's no chance that they'll be able to have it again later in the following years. I can't imagine that this parade isn't like the number one like source of revenue for them in terms of <laughs> advertising. Right. Um, I feel like they would get a ton of profit from this every year. Surely. Well, and also (laughs) you have to think like, okay, well, but clearly they're very concerned about their competition, right? Especially with like this whole Lewis Clark plot Mm -hmm. line that we have here now. And so it's like, okay, you think that if you are not going to host this Thanksgiving parade this year, that some other department store isn't going to come around and snap up the opportunity to do that from you. And then like, like, why would you let that happen? The parade will go on. I'm sorry, it will. <laughs> Wild. But let's not pretend that it's like this thing that's bleeding you dry. Right. Come on now. Like, <laughs> right. Right. Anyway. Um, so Nancy decides that she should try to go talk to him. So she gets Jules to set up a meeting. Um, she's not really able to get much out of him. I think that she kind of uses like a cover story to get in to talk to him. But as soon as she like mentions the parade, he gets a little bit bit upset because obviously he didn't think that that's what this interview or whatever would be about Um, and he just starts talking about how much he hates the parade and (laughs) it just does kind of seem like maybe Jules is right maybe this is a motive here Uh, but then Nancy starts asking like do you think the parade could be sabotage maybe this could have been like an inside job because really the police only had what they found in the building Um, and he gets really upset and will not say anything else Uh, so Nancy leaves and she goes downstairs to meet up with Bess who is trying to help Jill with the costumes unfortunately Jill is not very nice to Bess right now Um, she clearly still believes that Bess is guilty of everything and is the reason that the clown costumes got lost so at this point um, there's really nothing else that they can do to help with the costumes at this point so they decide it is time to go have tea with Aunt Eloise (laughs) hooray they actually ask Aunt Eloise if she can bring with her to the tea that they're going to go to, bring the receipt for Bess's scarf that she'd signed for, because um, I guess Bess had left it at the apartment that morning. Um, so when they sit down for tea, she pulls out the receipt, and Nancy looks at it and sees that this version is actually the carbon copy. Mm. Um, so, of course, when the receipt was signed initially, when she bought the scarf, they would have kept the original receipt, and then underneath right. that would have been the carbon copy that the store kept. But both the one that Bess was given and the store version had the carbon copy signature on it. Right. So where is the original signature? Mm -hmm. Clearly someone put another piece of paper over Bess's original receipt, Mm -hmm. got her to sign that, and then that's what caused the two pieces of paper below it to actually have the carbon copy on it. Um, Which is honestly like genius. Yeah, truly. (laughs) And really could have only worked in the 90s, right. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it seems like obviously that's how someone was able to get Bess to sign the clown 
receipt is because the clown receipt was just on top and whoever it was at the store just handed her a different piece of paper and because mm-hmm. she was distracted she didn't notice yep so at this point nancy decides that it is time to break into lewis and clark's <laughs> Lewis Clark's <laughs> office, excuse me, <laughs> to hunt for clues. And and Eloise kind of protests. She thinks that it's a little bit risky, but she decides that she's going to go with them because, hey, well, if Nancy's getting herself into danger, why not? And also, obviously, we love that, or she loves that Nancy yes. does this and that she gets to kind of tag along. So very fun. Oh, I love Anne Eloise. She literally so is great. like, I love the excitement you bring into my life, Nancy. <laughs> yes. oh, my gosh. Um, So they go over to Lewis Clark's office and they're able to sneak in pretty easily and everything kind of looks normal. Mm -hmm. Just some papers on his desk. Everything seems, you know, nothing out of the ordinary here, except in his desk drawer. They find some perfume samples and Nancy smells it and she notices this smells exactly like the ones that Jules had created for that new cosmetics line. It smells exactly like the ones that we got to kind of sample the other day when we got that tour. So, did Lewis steal the Mitchell's exclusive fragrance? Oh, maybe so. Espionage. (laughs) Then, I guess underneath that or something, they find a piece of paper with all these formulas written on it. Um, And so, Nancy, like, photocopies it so that they can take it for evidence. And then they manage to sneak out and almost get caught by the cleaning lady. But it's all right. They get out in the end. And then why not Nancy and Bess get invited to go to a club that evening? Yep. I think Nancy says something about, like, why didn't Anne Eloise want to go clubbing with yeah. us or something <laughs> like that? So Nancy and Bess go to the club where all the, I guess, the parade people have all decided to come to this club party tonight. Um, and so everybody's kind of in this area of the club. And Nancy runs into um, Greg and Neil. And so Greg goes over to like talk to Bess or whatever. And then Nancy's sitting there with Neil and she's like, oh, hey, I found your ID badge the other day. You left it at whatever place they were at where, she, where he left it. Um, here it is. And he's like, oh, thank you. He takes it back. And she's like, well, wait a minute. You've been at work the past couple of days. How have you been getting like in and out of the building? And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. I got a replacement already. As soon as I noticed it was gone, like it wasn't a big deal. But thank you for returning it anyway. Right. Um, But then we flash to Greg and Bess. They are out on the dance floor. And Nancy notices that Greg is kind of yelling at Bess. And then Bess runs off in tears. Mm. So Nancy runs after her. And Bess tells her that Greg refuses to see her anymore. Because the Grand Marshal of the Parade, quote unquote, shouldn't be seen with the lead suspect. Oh, what a classy guy. So nice. (laughs) But then they go back to Aunt Eloise's house and Aunt Eloise tells them that actually Greg just called for her and wants to meet her tonight to Mm. apologize, maybe. Um, But he wants to meet her at the parade warehouse to talk about everything that happened that night. Um, So, of course, Bess is like thrilled by this. And she's like, I have to go right now. And Nancy's like, no, 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 don't go. What if it's dangerous? You going alone in New York at night? And so Bess is determined to go. So Nancy's like, all right, if you're going, I'm just going to come with you because I don't want you to get into any sort of trouble. So Bess, like, insists that Nancy wait outside or whatever because Greg told her that, like, he wanted to talk to her alone. So Nancy's standing outside and about five minutes go past and she starts to, like, go in after her. She's like, it's been too long now. (sighs) Something's up. I I don't know. After about five minutes, she decides to go in after her. And then as she does, sirens start to go off in the background. And all these police cars pull up. Jill shows up. And they all go inside the warehouse. I guess the cops had gotten a call that the, like, building or whatever was broken into. And so they go inside. And Bess is just standing in the middle of the warehouse with all these slashed balloons around her. The parade float balloons. Just absolutely slashed to pieces all around her. So this looks really, really bad, obviously. It looks like Bess has come in here and just destroyed everything (laughs) in these five minutes that Nancy wasn't with her. And Nancy can't even alibi her because she doesn't, she wasn't there, obviously. Uh, Bess is crying through her tears. It wasn't me. I would never do this. It was like this when I got in here. And it seems like the police and Jill both believe that she is guilty of this. So... 
at this point, they're like, well, where's the security guard? There yeah. should have been a security guard here. So they're like, let's go look for him. And they find him, like, tied up and gagged in the corner somewhere. And Bess is like, well, I definitely didn't do this either. And they're like, well, you must have. I mean, clearly. Yeah, you, I'm sure tiny girl and compared to this big burly security guard mm-hmm. man i'm sure you managed to overtake him in the five yeah. minutes that you've been here right <laughs> and the security guard is telling them that he's been tied up for like at least 15 minutes right. or so but nancy and bess only got here five right. minutes ago right but the police are just not hearing it Crazy. Um, but obviously someone is framing bess because right. they knew that she'd be walking into this and how it would look when they found her Um, So the police asked Jill, like, do you want us to press charges on Bess for breaking and entering? But Jill says no for some reason, but then tells Nancy that she can't even look at Bess anymore. So, like, I'm not going to press charges, but get her out of my face, basically. Oh, poor Bess. This is so upsetting. It's so upsetting because she's obviously so innocent. And, like, I understand, yes, like, she's been in all these crazy, like, setups or whatever. But, like, I don't understand how, as, like, an adult, like, woman who is responsible for this parade, Mm -hmm. you can be like, here's this teenage girl who came onto the scene literally yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, like, I'm going to choose to single her out and think that she's guilty instead of understanding that she's being framed, which is, like, so incredibly obvious. Right. Like, if you took five minutes to listen to Nancy, you would understand how obvious it is that she's being framed. Like, jeez. I can't. I hate Jill. Jill is the yeah. worst. Jill's terrible. She's horrible. So, so yes, they leave. And then the next morning, they decide that they're going to go meet up with Jules because he needs to know about this possible fragrance stealing situation from Lewis Clark. Uh, So they go to him and he does confirm that, yes, that is absolutely the formula for our new fragrance. They have stolen this from us. So Nancy and Bess go to Lewis's office to confront him. And he basically tells them, like, no one will believe you. If anyone tries this with me, I'll just say that they stole it from me and there will be no way to prove otherwise. Like, they have no proof that I didn't come up with this first. Like, blah, blah, blah. There's not even going to be any point of them, like, pursuing this legally. But that wasn't a denial, sir. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Seems pretty guilty to me. And so, yeah, they take this as like him confirming that, yeah, he absolutely did steal it. So they go meet meet back up with Jules and tell him what happened. And now Nancy is like, well, we need to look in your father's office to see if there's any evidence that maybe your dad was like in on it with Lewis Clark. And, like, maybe they're working together or something. So let's go look into this and see if we can find anything. And Jules is just on board. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll help you with that. (laughs) And his secretary knows me so well that if we just all walk in together, his secretary will let me in his office. And I happen to know that he's going to be, like, at this meeting from this time. So it'll be, like, the perfect time to go. So they go. And they're able to sneak in, start searching and everything. And just as Nancy starts rifling through the desk drawers to find the clues that she needs, Howard Langley busts through the door. Obviously, of course, they get caught. So luckily, Jules is able to cover for them by telling his dad about the perfume formula being stolen and saying like, oh, you know, we were just in your office trying to look for paperwork to prove that like Mitchell's came up with this formula first and so Howard buys that and is furious about Lewis Clark stealing Mitchell's property. So he calls his lawyers and ends up sending Nancy and Beth away while he's trying to deal with this perfume theft issue. Afterwards, Bess wants to go back to the warehouse to try to help repair the balloons because she feels horrible about this whole situation, right? But Nancy's like, oh, I don't know that Jill's going to appreciate that, but I want to go back to the warehouse too to investigate more. So sure, let's go. Once they're there, Nancy explains to Jill about the perfume being stolen and her suspicions that it might actually be like Howard Langley sabotaging his own parade. Apparently, this is like plausible enough to Jill that it makes her doubt her suspicions of Bess, which, okay, whatever, Jill, I don't like you, so (laughs) I don't care about anything you do. Um, But Nancy then decides to ask, like, is there any way at all that you can track who, like, who comes and goes from the warehouse at like what times. And Jill remembers like, Oh yeah, actually there is, we have to use electronic key card badges to swipe into the warehouse. Oh my God. Why is this not the very first thing you looked at? 
Why is the police not looking at this when they were looking into the explosion? Who was in the building? Maybe that could have been mm-hmm. some evidence there. Oh, my god! You gosh. think that that's where you would start? You would yeah. clear Bess so fast if you just looked and seen that there's no way she could have been there? This is wild to me. I mean, like, I know this is supposed to be the 90s, so maybe this is, like, I don't know, new technology or something. I don't think it was that new in the 90s, no. but sure. A swipe card? No. Yeah, like... <laughs> Okay, but like to like have that be your fancy new security system or whatever, and to not even at the beginning be like, wait, what about the security systems we have in place? Why haven't they prevented this? Maybe we should dig into that and see Jeez. what that's about. You know, it takes it takes a teen sleuth from out of town to come in and tell you, hey, do you have any kind of like security system to see who comes and goes from your facilities? For you to oh, be you like, do? yeah, the New York City Police Department didn't think about that. Your own security staff didn't bring that up. Think about that. It takes a 19 year old, maybe 18 year old detective from out of town to tell you to look at your security system. I can't. I can't with you this woman. Y'all uh, deserve to be sabotaged. If this is how you go about it. Seriously. Like- <laughs> um, and you know, and so you you end up making like a teenage girl cry because you don't you're not competent (laughs) enough to protect your own property i can't i can't anyway so yeah jill ends up calling security and they give them a thick report of all the key cards that have been swiped in the past week and nancy and Bess help jill like scour these reports for anybody who was in the warehouse around the time of the sabotage they end up seeing that someone named heath nealon was always in the warehouse during each of the different sabotage instances and jill looks him up and determines that he's actually like a stock boy for mitchell's but it's like why would he be in the warehouse? He would have no reason to be in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. He would only ever work in like the department store. So she right. calls him and his supervisor and they were like, well, no, Heath has never been in the warehouse. Right. But his ID card they learn was stolen just a couple days ago. Whoa. Okay. All right. When, by the way, Bess wasn't in town. I'm just, Mm. I just want to make that clear to everyone. Okay. So easiest alibi ever. Yeah. Literally wasn't even in the state. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I just, what's crazy to me is that this is still not enough to clear Bess's name. Like clearly. So someone stole this kid's, this kid's ID card and has been using it to swipe into the warehouse where this kid should not have ever been. And always around the time that the sabotages are happening and you're like no maybe maybe it's still Bess who couldn't She's have stolen still cold to Bess Who's... after this yes we'll we'll get there but like yes <sighs> anyway so obviously whoever stole this ID card is the one responsible for the sabotage but we still don't know who stole the ID card um, but then at this point, Neil and Greg show up. They came to get like some publicity shots or something for the parade. But the tension between Bess and Greg is like really awkward. Both of them in this office together, they like can't even look at each other. And it's so bad that like Bess ends up having to like excuse herself just to get out of here. And then once she leaves, Jill tells Nancy that really Nancy needs to like take Bess away. Like Bess shouldn't be around this anymore because she doesn't want her to be like around if any more sabotage happens. Like she doesn't I mean, want that's valid. Yes. She doesn't want more reason for Bess to be considered a suspect. So that's fine. Yeah. We get that. But then Oh, my God. (laughs) So then Greg is like, I know. I'll take her out tonight. I can't. Sir. I, this man. (laughs) Anyway. Yes, for real. But he's like, oh, I feel bad about listening to other people's advice and staying away from her because I really like her. And this is probably the last chance that I'll have to, like, you know, talk to her, be with her and, like, repair our friendship. Like, I at least want to, like, leave New York as friends. Not with an argument mm. right which i guess is nice and whatever but it's just like dude like you make this you girl know cry her. twice like mm-hmm. and like you've known her for a day like maybe it's time to just gracefully exit yeah. like it's too late you yelled at her on a dance floor i can't i'm sorry yeah i don't truck with yelling i don't i can't handle people who yell uh, especially in public like even if she were guilty come on seriously dude. seriously and also like how old is he that 
how old is this mm, man? Right. And Bess is 18, 19. This is just, it's I, it's creepy and I don't like it. Um, Rick Arlen it all over again. Yeah. And it's like, he clearly has a lot of like, even if he's not that much older than her, he clearly has a lot more power than her. He's definitely more mm-hmm. wealthy than she is. Um, but he is like incredibly famous. So it's like such an imbalanced power situation and for him to be yelling at her on a dance floor making her cry and now swooping in and be like well i'll take her out because i feel bad dude get Get away from this girl like you do not have any business talking to her anyway y'all are never gonna see each other again after the parade like no and while Jeez. I agree that he's probably not horrible, like, yes, he shouldn't have yelled, but at least he wants to make up for it. I just be like, dude, like, you, you just don't have any business, yeah. like, doing any of this. Like, just get away. Get away. We're good. Just cut your losses and leave us alone. You know? Like, yeah. No. Anyway, so, yeah. So, Neil ends up telling Greg that he has, like, passes for this club, which, by the way, is called Dot Matrix, which I thought was hilarious. Um tonight so he and Bess, greg and Bess, should stop by his apartment to get those passes for the club and they can go do that tonight to kind of keep Bess away from all this stuff this is how you know we're in the dot-com boom <laughs> is because clubs are called dot matrix <laughs> i love it i thought it was going to be code it's like actually some sort of just office that they <laughs> analyze paperwork at that <laughs> so funny oh my god um, okay, but then Nancy's like, okay, well, since Bess is going to be out with Greg tonight, I'm going to go to the Natural History Museum because that's where they're, like, staging the parade and where it's going to start in the morning. And Nancy thinks that this is probably, like, the last chance that somebody is going to have to sabotage the parade. So she wants to be there in case that happens. She wants to catch whoever it is in the act. Um, so she gets there, and after, like, some hustle and bustle, like, she's, you know, watching all the employees, like, do their stuff or whatever, Nancy realizes that she has somehow found herself alone in, like, this big cavernous room where all the balloons are being inflated. Um, I think it's where they keep the dinosaurs in the Natural History yes. Museum, which mm-hmm. I think is amazing. So she's in there. Jules ends up, like, startling her, but it's actually a good thing he ends up being there because suddenly Nancy hears something, and she looks over, and she sees sees one of the ropes holding an inflated balloon snap and then it looks like another one on like that same balloon is about to give so jules tells nancy to like run and try and hold it down like hold the rope for this balloon down by herself while she goes while he goes and runs for help oh my gosh (laughs) so while she's holding it nancy realizes that the rope that like she's holding looks like it was cut part of the way um so sabotage right and so she's like about to yell for jules like hey come back like i need your help someone hits her on the back of the head she smells something sweet and everything goes dark when she wakes up um jules and two security guards are standing over her they help her up and make sure she's okay jules explains that like he was maybe gone for like 10 minutes getting the guards and when he came back nancy was unconscious um they did manage to retie the rope on the balloon before it snapped and they also saw that it had been cut and they also looked and saw all the other ropes had also been partially cut and so they fixed them as well Um, oh my gosh i know So Nancy has to go outside for some air because she's obviously, you know, has a head injury and is still woozy um, after having been hit over the head. Eileen, the news anchor, ends up showing up. And after, like, she did some, like, I don't know, publicity shots or reporting or whatever it is, she invites Nancy out for coffee. It's now, like, 5.30 a.m., by the way. And the parade is supposed to start in, like, three hours. So it's we're getting down to the wire here. Yeah. (laughs) So they're in this coffee shop. They start talking about the case and Nancy ends up opening up to her about all of her suspicions of Lewis Clark and Howard Langley. Um, But then Nancy has this thought and she opens up her purse to look a little bit closer at the list of people who had badged into the warehouse. She realizes that instead of looking for people on the list who shouldn't have been there, she should be looking at the list for people who were there but aren't are missing from the list mm-hmm. who should be there who should be there. Right. So she looks down this list and she realizes that Neil steam who had been in the warehouse multiple times. She personally observed him being in the warehouse 
does not show up on the security log. Mm. Meaning he must have badged into the warehouse using someone else's card. Potentially a stolen card from some stock boy, perchance. Mm -hmm. Um, Nancy also realizes that she remembers right before she was knocked out, she smelled something sweet. Something that now she realizes smelled exactly like Mitchell's perfume. That only, like, Neil, like, had, like, a special unreleased version that he wore. Like, he's the only one who wore it. Nobody else did. Mm. So, it looks like it's Neil is the culprit. Finally, Nancy. Yes. Finally, you figure it out. (laughs) Yes. So, both Nancy and Eileen rush back to the parade prep area to look for Jill because they, of course, they need to warn her about Neil. Eileen ends up having to go back to her crew because it's time for them to start their reporting. But by this point, Nancy is able to find Jill. But Jill is not happy with Nancy for accusing Neil. Uh, She defends him and is like, he works so hard for this company. He has made like so much effort to make sure things go smoothly. Like, how could you blame him for this? Um, And then Jill like turns it back around on Nancy and is like, I mean, if you're going to sit here accusing thing, like accusing people of things, do you even know where Bess is right now? How do we know it's not Bess? It's like, you know it's not Bess, we Jill. We just Come went on. over this, Jill. With the, the, the cards, the swipe cards, don't you remember, Jill? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I can't with this woman. But at this point, Nancy does realize, like, oh, actually, I have no idea where Bess is because Bess and Greg were going to go out clubbing last night to the Dot Matrix Club or whatever. (laughs) And then they were obviously supposed to just, like, go to bed. So Bess should have gone back to Aunt Eloise's last night. And then they had a plan to meet up at, like, 6 a.m. at the parade grounds or whatever. And then Nancy had planned to just stay at the parade all night. And so she never went back to Aunt Eloise's last night. And so at this point... With Nancy freaking out, Jill realizes that Greg is nowhere to be found. They call his hotel, and his hotel said that he never went back to his room last night. So the last time he was seen was also with Bess last night before they left the club. Now Greg and Bess are both missing, and Nancy's obviously freaking out. Yeah. Um, Aunt Eloise shows up to the parade at this point because she was supposed to come anyway this morning, but she's freaking out already because she already knows, like, Bess never came home last night. So she just kind of, like, assumed that she was with Nancy, but then arrives and realizes that Nancy doesn't know where she is either. So Eloise tells us that she saw Bess yesterday evening because I guess Bess had con- come back to Eloise's apartment to wait for Greg to pick her up. But that was the last time she saw her was right before or right when she was leaving with Greg. And then Nancy remembers like, oh, Neil was the one that had the tickets for the club. And so right. when they left Eloise's apartment, they probably would have gone to Neil's apartment to get the tickets and then headed to the club. No. All right. <laughs> All right. So, Neil, obviously, yeah, must know where they are. So she and Anna Eloise race over to his apartment building because he had given them the address actually earlier in the story, so they already know where he Which, is. Like, by the way, it's like East. Oh, yeah. It's like Eight East Eighty Eighth Street Apartment Eighty Eight. Like. What? Yeah, it's 8888th Street, apartment number 88, like, or something what? like that. <laughs> and so they put that in there, obviously, so right. that it's, like, really, really memorable. Yeah. And so it's easy for Nancy to just remember it, even though she hadn't written it down anywhere. I just think um, that's hilarious. So, yeah, <laughs> super convenient, right? <laughs> uh, but they get there, and Nancy picks the lock, obviously. And then they bust through the apartment. They're turning everything over, but there is no sign of Bess or Greg anywhere. <laughs> They do, however, find the missing clown costumes just in a closet in his apartment. Great. And then on the coffee table, she sees a clipping of a newspaper article about a building demolition that is supposed to be happening today. Um, And actually, it's somewhere that they had just walked past the other day. So Nancy already like knows where this building is. Um, And so she starts to put it together like, oh, yeah, Neil took... Bess and Greg there so that we'd have a, you know, final scene type of moment where they're killed in the building demolition. Mm -hmm. So she realizes that that must be where Neil has Greg and Bess. Um, So she (laughs) runs outside, she grabs Anne Eloise and they head over to that building that is about to be demolished. 
they get there and they have four minutes to spare. Nancy doesn't even like stop to talk to anybody mm-hmm. at the build site. She just runs right in. And the foreman is like yelling at her like, stop. This building's going to blow up in four minutes. It's like rigged on this timer. And I have no way to stop the timer. Which you can't go in there. Yeah. Come on. come on. Let's be real. There's no fail safe. There's no like pull the plug. Don't don't set off explosives. What kind of demolition is this? Right. You can't just start. You can't just start a countdown and not stop it. That's the whole point mm-hmm. of a countdown is to like just in case, like is like a waiting period mm-hmm. so that you can pull the plug in case something's wrong. Right. Because otherwise, then why wouldn't you just have like a plunger that just did it? Yeah, just you know? do it right then and there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry. Continue. <laughs> So, and the building is already, like, boarded up and everything, and I guess it's been boarded up, so there was no, like, preliminary check of the building to make sure that it was vacant before they actually started the demolition, because they just assume, like, nobody's going to pull these boards off to go inside and then board themselves back in somehow. Okay, but, like, this is New York City. I'm sorry. There is a large population of people who are homeless in Mm -hmm. New York City. And you're telling me that you're not concerned at all about anyone trying to get into the building for shelter purposes. And like, you're just going to in the winter, in the the winter. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. you're just going to blow up this building without checking. Yeah. Come on. Let's let's get real here. I'm getting hot thinking about this. I'm mad. (laughs) Yeah. This is the real this is the real villain behavior here. Yes. Is this construction company right here who is blowing up buildings can't stop the explosions that they've rigged not checking buildings to make sure people aren't still inside of it just going to blow up people who are unhoused just happily mm-hmm. just on Thanksgiving day by the yeah. way. Oh, you know, let's just let's just murder people. Sorry, I'm I'm yep. I'm upset. <laughs> Yep. This is crazy. So four minutes in, and Nancy is just obviously not hearing anything that the foreman or the crew is yelling at her, telling her to stop, because she's pulling boards off. She's bursting inside. Aunt Eloise is right behind her. It's obviously a huge building, too. It's really tall. So Nancy's like, I'll take upstairs. You go downstairs, Aunt Eloise. They split up and start just like sprinting through the building, looking for any clue where they are. Um, Nancy is actually able to find Bess and Greg tied up kind of half conscious on the second floor somewhere is able to untie them. They start running out. They grab Anne Eloise on their way and they, they all get out. Nancy's the last one. She like pushes everyone out in front of her. And then the building just explodes behind her. Like there's literally one second left. I love it <laughs> so much. This is such a classic file scene. This know, is like so good. 1990s Charlie's Angel style explosion mm-hmm. in the background. Yes. Jumping Slow-mo. out of the door, <laughs> rolling on the ground. It's too good. Too good. Uh, Oh my gosh. <laughs> so everyone's alive. Everyone is okay. The building explodes anyway. Um, the foreman is like baffled <laughs> as to how two people went in and four people came out. <laughs> and Nancy is like, I don't have time to explain because I only have 45 minutes to get Greg to be the grand marshal of the parade. We have to make it in time. I have 45 minutes to get yeah. this guy to the lead float in the Mitchell's Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> I have no time for this. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so crazy. Also, another of the like least plausible things in this entire book, when Aunt Eloise initially comes to find Nancy at the parade when they were still at the park or whatever where they're setting this up, Aunt Eloise just finds a parking spot right in front <laughs> in New York City. <gasps> like people were and then, camped out for days for the right. Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Or that the roads wouldn't be blocked (laughs) off for the parade route. Right, you know, right, right, right. And so they just get into Aunt Eloise's car. They drive to the construction site. All of this happens. And then Aunt Eloise is like, you know, it's a little late now. We probably just need to take a (laughs) cab because it's going to be hard finding parking in time. There won't be enough time to find parking. Not that there won't be parking. It's just that it'll take us extra time to find it. So we'll just need to take a cab now and come back for my car later. Okay. Okay, Anna Louise. Thanks, I don't Sherlock. Know. That just seemed like 
uh, really implausible to yeah. me that anybody could park anywhere in New York. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, uh, so they do get a cab and they get themselves over to the parade. Um, by the way, Greg is still in last night's clothes, hasn't showered, is yeah. covered in like, you know, demolition debris yes. and soot and everything. <laughs> and they're like, just get him to make up. He'll be fine. He'll be good for the uh-huh. parade or whatever. Uh, but anyway, so they're in the cab on the way over and Bess and Greg start explaining what happened last night. So essentially, they went over to get the tickets from Neil's apartment for the club that they were going to go to. Neil kidnapped them, tied them up, and then bragged to them about everything that he'd done to pull off the rest of the sabotage. So he explains how he tricked Bess into signing the receipt for the clown costumes, making her think that it was her scarf receipt. Um, explain how he was the one that cut all the balloon ropes or whatever blah 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 he does his villain speech yes it's him (laughs) um so they get to the parade and jill is very relieved to see greg they like i said they rush him over to make up to get him all cleaned up or whatever and then uh to jill's shock nancy starts explaining that they've gotten confirmation that yeah neil is the one behind all of this and he's the one that kidnapped them so Nancy asks, like, okay, where is Neil? And we learn that he is over by the clowns. So Of course he is, because he's a clown. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> they run over to him, and Neil sees Nancy coming over to, he- over to him, and so he, like, smiles or whatever, but then notices that Bess is right behind her, and then, like, realizes he's been caught, obviously. And so he tries to flee, but the clowns <laughs> think that him running away is, like, a joke, and so they start, like, I guess... <laughs> playing into this bit that they think he's doing and they start like spraying him with water and like knocking him down and all this stuff so they're able to stop him and then um actually he does end up getting through the the crowd of clowns pretty easily and throws a table at nancy (laughs) yeah which is wild you want to take the left sure sure. yeah so he throws the table at Nancy, but that, of course, doesn't stop her, right? She dodges the table and then manages to karate kick him, bring him to the ground, and pin his arms behind his back. And another fabulous files move, because, of course, it wouldn't be complete without Nancy performing some karate move, right? Of course. <laughs> um, so the police arrive and arrest Neil, and they find the multiple ID cards on him, and he ends up confessing to attacking Nancy the night before, and you know, setting up Bess at every opportunity. Um, He explains basically that he just set up Bess because after her sunglasses were found by the like tanks that exploded in the warehouse and the police suspected her, she was just like an easy target. So thanks. Yeah. Luckily, Eileen's news crew happens to capture all of this on film. And yeah, then, Eileen, thank yeah. you. <laughs> and Eloise ends up inviting everyone over to her apartment after the parade for Thanksgiving dinner. Jill apologizes for having been so mean to Bess and continuing to suspect her. Howard, that's <laughs> right, Jill. That <laughs> yes. is right. Yes. Um, Howard Langley and Jules tell Nancy that their lawyers managed to scare Lewis and he signed something saying that he wouldn't attempt to recreate Mitchell's signature scent. Um, How is that going to hold up in court? (laughs) I don't know. Okay. Um, And as a reward for excellent sleuthing and general good naturedness, Nancy and Bess are invited to ride on the lead float with Greg in the Mitchell's Thanksgiving Day Parade. They get on the float and they wave happily to the crowd and Bess tells Nancy that this is the best Thanksgiving ever. Oh, yeah. And that's the end. (laughs) Oh, I think Bess also says something about, like, George is going to be so jealous when she sees us on TV. She does! (laughs) And I love that it's, like, all it takes is like George or, Na- or Bess thinking that George is going to be like peeved or something to make her yeah. have a good time yes. and make <laughs> getting kidnapped, being framed, crying on the dance floor in the middle of a club, all worth it for her best Thanksgiving ever because George is going to be jealous of me. <laughs> hey, Greg forgave her in the end. So she got the cute boy to flirt with her. Oh. Worth it, right? I guess. Uh, I guess. Oh, my God. Okay, but we have to talk about the real star. Who cares about Greg? Let's talk about the (laughs) real star of this book, and that's obviously Aunt Eloise. Oh, my gosh. I know. (laughs) I could have used more of her, honestly. Yeah. But I thought it was going to be less, so I was happy with it. Right. I feel like, yeah, we got some really good Aunt Eloise scenes, um, which there is one in particular that I want to read, too, because I think it's my favorite. So uh, I've I've marked that one, and I'll go back and read that in a second. But I do just want to point out that... 
Aunt Eloise definitely does not seem to be friends with any of these people, even though she's gotten this like whole backstage tour for Mm -hmm. Nancy and Bess, because like at every opportunity, there's like dinners, there's like multiple parties, there's like plenty of opportunities for Aunt Eloise to have been invited to these things. And she just hasn't been. So it's not like she's like childhood best friends with Jill or something like that's not that's not the case. She just happens to know her or something. And and so I just think that even speaks to more to how wild all of these situations that Nancy and Bess find themselves in. But anyway, mm. um, okay, where is it? So, okay, it's in chapter 14. It's when Nancy and Aunt Eloise are heading to Neil's apartment to try to see if um, Bess, and, uh, Bess and Greg are there. So there's the building, Aunt Eloise announced 10 minutes later. Why don't you get out here in all park, she said, looking down the street for an open spot. Um, while she waited for her aunt, Nancy turned to look at the apartment building, blah, blah, blah. Oh, she frowned when she spotted an door man standing behind the glass doors in the lobby. All set, Eloise said, coming up to Nancy. She started for the building's entrance, but Nancy held her back. There's a doorman, Nancy cautioned. Her aunt grinned at her. No problem, she said, shaking her car keys. I'll tell him I have a problem with my car. When he comes out to help me, you can sneak inside. Nancy kissed her aunt on the cheek. That's brilliant. It's no wonder we're related, her aunt said, looking pleased. (gasps) I love this. Yes. Eloise Drew, ladies and gentlemen. Eloise Drew. She is truly a Drew. She's related to Carson. Yeah. She's related to Nancy. She is just as resourceful, just as excited with all of the mm-hmm. crime. The point where, like, they go to break into Lewis Clark's office. First, she's like, oh, Carson wouldn't be happy with me for letting you do this or whatever. But let's go because I'm let's go. so excited to do this. So, like, I love this characterization of Eloise Drew. Can we have an Eloise Drew book, please? Can we have a whole book with just Eloise? I know. I feel so like much. Nancy is way more like her aunt than yes. Carson will ever admit to himself. Oh, I just yeah. picture Carson in the middle like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? These yeah. women are too similar. This is all my fault. <laughs> like, <laughs> But yes, I know, I know I've said this to you like a million times. I don't know if I've said it on the podcast, but we need so badly mm-hmm. like a prequel series yes. about our older Drew Crew generation, mm-hmm. Carson, Aunt Eloise, yep. throw Kate in there. Like mm-hmm. we need an earlier series to see what that kind of sibling dynamic would have been like. Yes. I know it was so good. Yes. It would make Sipper such a good story. Yes. I think I pitched, I pitched a, uh, this to you a while ago. So what we need is because we were trying to figure out is Eloise older than Carson or is Carson older than Eloise? Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, but I get the vibes that Eloise is older, but maybe not like super older, like maybe just like a couple of years or something. Right. Like I think they're really close in age. And I feel like Aunt Eloise is new to New York City. She gets a job teaching. She lives in a crappy rundown apartment. And Carson, who is going to Columbia University for mm-hmm. law school, shows up and is like, hey, I'm going to stay at your apartment while I go to law Yay. school. Thanks so much. You know, and then we can see their escapades in the city together. Eloise so Drew good. getting dragged along with all of Carson's cases. Mm -hmm. And he gets to be like some paralegal for some law firm while he's still up and coming and going through law school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he ends up like solving all of these cases for his like layabout boss or whatever. He's really the one who solves Mm -hmm. it all. But his boss gets all the credit. And I just. But Eloise is helping him with it the whole time. And they meet Kate Drew. Yes. 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 (laughs) They fall in love. And yeah. Oh. Oh, it'd be so good. It'd be so be good. So good. I love oh. Anna Eloise. She's such a stellar character. Truly. And I don't understand why we don't have more of her just to like otherwise. Like in the mystery stories, I feel like she's only ever mentioned like a handful of times. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we ever get any, except maybe in like Brassbound Trunk, I guess. True. Yeah. She's, but like really, they just use her in that book as an opportunity to like use her apartment because right. there's like a dinner or something that they have. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's not enough. It's not enough. And so I just really appreciative of this book yeah. of like having her not only just being like a, you know, 
landing space for Nancy to like stay mm-hmm. at while she's in New York, but to also be like a legitimate like character and player in her own right, like helping Nancy mm-hmm. with the investigation and like showing up and like having an actual personality and like a mischievousness that's like mm-hmm. common to like the Drew family and yes. caring about Nancy as like an aunt, but also being like a little bit like enabling Nancy mm-hmm. as an aunt. It's just it's so good chef's kiss yeah perfect Perfect. yes perfect that's all i care about i don't have anything else i want to say except (laughs) oh my god Anne eloise (laughs) you know i don't think it was until we finished the summary just now that it occurred to me how many mysteries we have that are like centralized around perfume or where perfume Mm. is like the thing that helps her solve it in the end. Like it's the final clue that she Yeah, needs. that's so true. What else do we have? Like Gray Fox Inn was that way with the sister's perfume. Um, uh, was it Tolling Bell where they had the perfume? Or per- Reggae yes. Farm? Reggae Farm, yeah. they have perfume. But Tolling mm-hmm. Bell, they have makeup. Is it perfume specific or is it make? It might be both. Both, maybe. But Redgate Farm, Redgate Farm, definitely. That's the one where that's like mm-hmm. the the code or whatever that's like mm-hmm. the tell for like the secret society members or whatever oh yeah there's a lot is that just like a they're trying to make it girly and they're like girls like perfume <laughs> let's Maybe. use that you know mm-hmm. i don't hate it i think it's probably like you know it's more about i think this is something that girls or women or whatever they're the only ones who notice this but it's mm. actually something that can be really important and so I kind of like that. I kind of like that. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's nice. It's like a nice nod to like, okay, well, these things that like maybe are stereotypically girly can actually be really important and really impactful. Mm-hmm. And it's not stupid at all that girls pay attention to it. Right. Um, so I like Especially that. because it's going to be yeah. so useful in the final, like mm-hmm. figuring things out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love how they use it in that way. Too. Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah. You remember that little scent that we mentioned earlier? Yeah. It's back. Yeah. Yep. It's really, yeah, it's nice. It's a nice plot device. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of anything else, but I do feel like, I agree. I think it's, it feels like it's something that's in a lot of them. And even mm. if it's just Nancy, like, smelling something and, like, recognizing that scent as being how someone else smells. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I feel like that happens quite a bit. It's useful. It is yeah. really useful. Um, okay, let's see what else. There's another Aunt Eloise moment on page 77. I think this is when they were going to break into Lewis's office. And yeah, so it's just just Aunt Eloise's quote um, on page 77 where she says, oh, you're not thinking what I what I think you're thinking, are you? Like, you're going to break into his office. And Nancy exchanged a look with Bess, then said to her aunt, I know you feel responsible for us, but clearing Bess is really important. If sneaking into Lewis Clark's office gives us proof against him, then that's what I'm going to do. After a short silence, Nancy's aunt threw up her hands. Well, I can't let you two go alone. If you're going, so am I. Nancy, you always add excitement to my life when you come to visit, she said with a (laughs) smile. She's like pretending like, oh, yeah, I go. no, it's like you've already decided in your mind that you're going. You're just going to give them a little bit of a hard time yeah. first. So funny. Yeah. But oh I do gosh. think there's also, sorry, not to talk more about Aunt Eloise. We've already moved Please do. This, but I do think there's also <laughs> moments in this where like she does show like how sensible she is too. I can't mm-hmm. remember where it is, but there's like a spot where like Nancy and Bess are going to go out late. It might be. Maybe when she gets best gets called to go to the factory mm-hmm. or something, but she's like, you know, like be careful. Like you remember, I'm responsible for you. Like don't take ri- you know, don't take unnecessary risks. Mm-hmm. But like, still lets them go. But just like right. telling them, like you know, you need to have caution. Like Carson would, you know, have my head if he didn't think yeah. <laughs> I was taking proper care of you. So like, you know, be careful. And so like, I really, I really appreciate that about mm-hmm. her. It really does seem. I think it really does show the similarities between Mm -hmm. Nancy and Ian Eloise. And I just love that so much. It's like this inherent trust between the two of Mm -hmm. them. is just so sweet. Yeah. Well, and also I think too, that like if Nancy, like if I picture Nancy older, I kind of picture Aunt Eloise in a lot of ways that like Aunt Eloise is single and Eloise is living alone in New York city. Like she has her own job. She does her own Mm -hmm. thing. She has lots of like various friends and connections similar to Carson. But like, I think Mm -hmm. about like Nancy is a, a, you know, older adult 
I can imagine that that's how she would live her life too. She would want to live somewhere where it's really exciting and there's lots of things mm-hmm. going on somewhere like New York City. She might probably be single. She would be, you know, she mm-hmm. would be self-supporting. She would have her own job. She would have so many different right. friends and acquaintances. She would have such a rich, like varied life. Like, you know, like, <sighs> I just love that. What a dream. What a dream. What a yes. And Eloise. <laughs> yeah. Mm, so good. I honestly, I literally don't think I have any other notes on this. <laughs> I don't yeah. have anything else to say. I think in general, it was just a really fun book. Really exciting. Yeah. Thank God, non-problematic for being about the Thanksgiving holiday. Right. Um, not mm-hmm. even really that heavy on like consumerism or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um which was surprising really honestly, surprising i kind of expected more of that yeah we don't even get actual thanksgiving dinner like yeah. we get aunt eloise invites everyone at the end to come join her mm-hmm. and she goes off to cook but it's not even about thanksgiving dinner itself. yeah yeah it was just it's just like funny exciting kind of crazy random wild ride mm-hmm. of a nancy drew file and like overall just like an enjoyable fun mystery you know mm-hmm. so it's like it was. great Great vibes. Great time. <laughs> my only, again, my only issue with it is this, that when Nancy suspects someone, it's like, yeah, there's not enough there. Like, why are we going mm. after the heads of these department stores with very little to go off that's of? That's true. You found a yeah. handkerchief. Yeah. And that's really not a reason to, to suspect the competitor's CEO. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't seem mm-hmm. the most logical to me. But otherwise, I can get over that just fine. Yeah, so. there was like, I think in general, like in the mystery, there was not a whole lot to go on. Like, no, the really the the only break in the case is when they remembered, oh, by the way, there are key cards that these people right. used to have to get into the building. Maybe that's important. I don't know. Yeah. Like, come on. So and I, I think I think my only like, you know grace for that kind of plot is that I, this really only happens over the course of three days like right, it's true. like they get there the crime happens they have like two days and then it's the the thanksgiving it's thanksgiving so day. it's yeah. like they really didn't have any time to find any other clues or Fair. do any kind of real slew thing nancy is really just reacting to things that are mm. happening which is a little bit annoying you know because it's you want it to be a detective story i do think mm-hmm. we get some like sleuthing moments of like breaking into places and kind of things but for the most part nancy is only doing those because of like things she's been told or things that have happened mm-hmm. so it's like okay I could have used that being a little bit more smooth, right. I guess. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Again, the setting, mm-hmm. so well done. Mm-hmm. Like, characterizing our trip to New York, I thought that that was really nail on the head. Where some sometimes the setting, it's like, I don't feel like I learned anything about that place. Right. But this one, it does feel like, oh, yeah, that's that's a New York tourist trip right mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I loved it. Flashlight score? Oh. Oh my gosh, dare I say five? No, I don't, ah, I don't know. Okay, um, in my heart of hearts, I want to give it a 4.75. Wow. Yeah. High praise. It is. I just don't think there's anything that wrong with it. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? Compared to the rest of it, I feel like it's almost close to perfect. I just, I think it's maybe not as... <laughs> What's, what is it missing? It's missing some of the tropes, I think, that are present mm. in a lot of the Nancy Drew books that I love. So it's missing, like, kind of secret passage vibes, like yeah. hidden will vibes, hidden, you know, that kind of, like, classic mm. Nancy Drew. It doesn't really feel like that. Um, but it is a Nancy Drew file. It feels very classic to the files. Mm. Um, does, yeah. but But that's not... So so this is complicated, right? Because I love the files, but it's also the files are a little bit of a twist on classic Nancy Drew. So I feel like it's almost a perfect example of the files, but I wish it was maybe a little bit more classic Nancy Drew. Mm-hmm. But that's it. But like only like a teeny tiny amount, because of course I love it. I love the files. I love the files for mm-hmm. what they are, you know? Yeah. So of course. Yeah. 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 What about you? I'm going to give it a four. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. it is really good. Like I said, it exceeded my expectations as far as just a parade story mm-hmm. would be. 
again, I just the sleuthing could have been a little bit stronger yeah. for me. Maybe after the sunglasses incident, Nancy goes back in, investigates herself, mm -hmm. and then finds some hidden clue that the police missed, and then right. that takes us down a little yeah. bit more of a stronger sleuthing storyline. The suspects maybe a little bit more stronger mm -hmm. reasons to suspect them, but otherwise it was really fun. Yeah. I really liked it. Yeah. There were a lot of people, but I mean, that is New York. Yeah. It needs to feel busy and crowded, mm -hmm. you know, so I yeah. guess that was... Well That's done true. in that sense, but That's true. yeah, good point. Okay, yeah, yeah, yay! Well, happy Thanksgiving, regular Drews. Yeah, I hope wherever you are, you are cozy, enjoying some good uh, meal, a good meal, and some you know family or friend time. Um, mm. Yeah, hopefully you'll get to watch the parade. Yes, and if you're like me, you'll be thinking a little bit more <laughs> about like everything that goes on behind the scenes this year because it is just, I mean, obviously, really difficult. To produce. Yeah. Like, there's a lot that goes into it. So, you know, I've never been like a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade person. Are you, Corey? Really? We always have it okay. on every year at Thanksgiving. Yeah, I don't know I that like I've it. ever watched it. I mean, obviously, I've seen like bits of it, but I've never like actually had it on and watched it during mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. So maybe I'll do that this year. Yeah, you should. Yeah. In honor of Nancy, yes. take a little watch and think about all the crazy stuff that could be happening behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, there could be all of this going on this year. There could be sabotage and explosions going on. And then the final production, you would never even know because everything would just never has know. to go off without a hitch. So exactly. Love it. Love productions. <laughs> it's just so exciting. Like everything that goes into it. Irrelevant Ooh. to this even. But yeah. 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 We usually just have it on in the background. And then yeah. after that, of course, is the real spectacle to watch is the dog show. So. Oh. I do okay. like. I do like watching the dog show. I was like, football? Is it football? No. <laughs> No, there's always the AKC dog show, yeah, I want to okay. say, right after that. And you have to pick your favorite and root for them and see if they're going to win. It's more exciting okay. than football, honestly. Well, see if your favorite wins. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. No, Just kidding, I'm but. so I'm with you. <laughs> I'm not a sports girly. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so but funny. anyway, yeah. So have a very <laughs> wonderful Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, but we're not done with the files just yet. We still have a couple more to go. Or I Thank guess, goodness. I mean. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, but so this next one is going to be, like I said, another file. This is number 23, Sinister Paradise. Thank you to our patrons for voting on this. This one is set in Hawaii, Corey. Ooh, okay. Yeah, Cup I don't know. Vibes. A little bit. So I'll read the back of it just so that you can get a little taste, a little teaser for what's coming up. A wealthy banking heiress summons Nancy to Hawaii to find her runaway granddaughter. So the banking heiress is millionaire Alice Faulkner, head of Windward Fidelity Bank. She's distraught about the disappearance of 16-year-old Lisa Trumbull, who vanished with the contents of her mother's safety deposit box. Ooh. But from day one, when Nancy and her companions, Ned, Bess, and George, nearly Yay. crash their rental car, she realizes they are targets of a deadly plot. Nancy follows the trail of the mysterious Malah oh gosh, Malahini Corporation until she discovers its connection to Windward Fidelity and finds herself hostage with Lisa in a helicopter hovering over the mouth of a spewing volcano. Ooh. Yes. I'm going to call it the Healy Healy Corporation, but that's yeah. fine. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> that's it. I wanted to say that, but Malahini, I was like, Healy, no, mm -mm. Nope, doesn't start close. with an H. Doesn't Very start close. with an H. <laughs> Ooh, but, yeah. okay. That'll be I'm fine. very excited for yes. it. Yeah. So that'll be uh, next regular Drews, and we will see you then. Yep. See you then. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you like this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at Regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at Regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $3 level vote on upcoming episode topics and get exclusive access to our Scoop Sesh series. And all patrons receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening.